brief story I'll share with you. A few, maybe a couple months ago, Bijou had sent me the schedule for the conference, and it showed this morning's message starting at 7.30. And so I told Katie, I said, you know, they're playing a prank on me. They're joking, talking about the conference starting this early. Our, our church has a lot of homeschooling families like this church, and I think perhaps because they don't have to get up early for school the next day, we just do things very late at our church. And so the idea that anything would ever start before like 9 a.m. at my church would be, um, you know, outlandish. And it'd be like a scandal or something. And so I told Katie, I, I looked at the email that Bijou sent me, and she said, here's the schedule, what do you think about it? And it showed this message starting at 7.30, and I told Katie, I said, you know, I bet at the greenhouse they're just cracking up about this, this big joke, <laughs> acting like the conference is going to start at 7.30, and they're all sitting around, you know, playing a prank on Pastor Scott and Katie. And so I thought, well, what if she's not joking? And so I really felt like there was this dilemma when I'm sitting at my computer, and I said, well, no, they must be joking. They must be joking. So I wrote back, and I said something like, okay, this, that's funny, or this is a joke, or something, or I'm, I'm really wondering, is this a joke? And they wrote back, and they said, no, we were really serious about starting at 7.30, and I just thought, wow, well. So then they kind of revised things and started at 8 a.m., and I just did not think there would be this many people at 8 a.m., you know? And so I just want to commend you. Wonderful job being here, especially concluding last night, you know, at 9 or something. So uh, thank you very much for coming out and making your marriages a priority. So if you want to take out your handout, begin on page 12 this morning. Our third message, a wife's submission. A wife's submission. Talked last night about a husband's love, this morning about a wife's submission. Page 12, I believe, in your handouts. I was at a, a church last week and had a marriage conf- a similar conference there, and I was contrasting the phenomenal job that the young people have done here for this conference, and just down to the handout and how great it looks and all the decorations and so forth. And so the other churches consider it was a pretty big church, and I just thought, boy, you guys are blessed to have so many wonderful young people that serve here and do such a great job with, with details. And yeah, definitely, yeah. Give them a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they can listen at this point, but thank you all very much for investing in the marriages here and providing. They're all back there serving while you can all be in here being fed, and so that's a tremendous blessing. I appreciate Pastor Kerry encouraging all of us yesterday, myself included, to thank these young people when we see them. So I want to begin by inviting you to think about the structure of teams or businesses or schools or really any organization. There are individuals in leadership. In businesses, there are CEOs. In sports, there are coaches. In um, organizations, there are presidents. In schools, there are principals. But think about what you never see. You never see two head what? Oh, man, it's still early. That's okay. That's okay. (laughs) Think sports. You never see two head coaches. You never see two presidents. You don't see two head pilots, two two head surgeons. Instead, you always see a head coach and an... That's okay, okay, yeah. Uh, you know, our pilot, co-pilot, president, and vice president, um, you know, principal, assistant principal. And this brings us to our first lesson in your handout. Lesson one, submission is necessary. Submission is necessary. It's interesting, even though everyone recognizes the need for submission and authority in all other areas of life, they struggle often to recognize the need for submission and headship in the marriage relationship. Typically, individuals with this view are called egalitarians, and they stand in contrast to complementarians, the husbands and wives complement each other. They don't see separate and distinct roles or responsibilities between men and women in the home or sometimes even within the church. And so if you were to apply their logic to the rest of the world, then you would see two head coaches or you'd see two head pilots. Can you imagine going in to be operated on and there's two head surgeons They're going to argue about what they should be doing on your two principles. Scripture is clear that this shouldn't be the case in in marriage. Ephesians 5.23, the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. 1 Corinthians 11.3, the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So while we're obviously going to be focusing on a wife's submission to her husband, it's important to notice that there's nobody except God the Father without a head. Because if you're listening to that verse in 1 Corinthians 11, who do husbands have as their head? Christ. Christ. Who does Christ have as his head? God. God the Father. And so nobody is without authority. Nobody is, is, uh, is able to go without submitting except for God the Father. 
Before we go any further in this discussion of submission, I'd like to make a, a brief point. While we know that Christianity is criticized for uh, commanding wives to submit to their husbands, I, I just want to invite you to keep in mind something that I had shared with you last night, that really it's Christianity. Nothing has done more for women, the treatment of them, the elevation of them, than Christianity. Nothing except for the gospel, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that brings women to that place of prominence and, and treatment um, that God wants to see take place. So with an understanding of the need for submission, let's briefly discuss what submission should and shouldn't look like, and this brings us to lesson two. Submission is not part one done kicking and screaming. <laughs> submission is not done part one kicking and screaming. And I want you to notice the way that I worded this. I wasn't talking just about wives submitting to their husbands. I worded the lesson this way because whether it's congregations to elders, I don't know how often people think about that, but congregations are expected to submit to their elders, whether it's employees to employers, whether it's children to parents, even whether it's Christians to one another, according to Ephesians 5.21, whether it's wives to husbands, if we're, if we're kicking and screaming while we're submitting, that's not really submission, that's rebellion. So the way we submit is as important as submitting itself. I'm going to say that one more time. The way we submit is as important as submitting itself. And when I used to teach elementary school, I told my students, if you obey me, but you do it with a bad attitude, you're going to be punished as though you didn't obey me. So for example, are there different ways that a student might take a book out of his or her desk and then bring the top of the desk down? You know, if, if, I, if everyone's working on math and this student doesn't have a book out and I say you need to take out your math book, and he takes it out, and he slams his desk lid down, and then he slams his book on his desk, then he needs to know he'll be punished for that as much as if he didn't take his book out at all. Or if a student is tipping, and you tell him to stop, stop tipping, and he slams his chair down, I always try to let my children know that basically, or my children or my students, that if they're submitting outwardly, but they're not submitting inwardly in the heart, then they're going to be punished as though they weren't submitting at all. And so... We think of submission as an action, and it definitely manifests itself outwardly, but where does submission take place or not take place if you're not submitting? In the heart. It is an internal, it is an inward action. When I was in the military, there was a lesson that one of our commanders taught us that I don't think I'll forget, and he said, what do you do with every order that you're given? And one of the reasons I remember it is none of us had the right answer. It seemed like, to me, to be a pretty easy question to be asked. He said, what do you do with every order you're given? And some of the answers, make sure you know exactly what you're being ordered to do, learn from the order, carry out the order as quickly as possible. And I don't know how many different answers we gave. And then he finally said, make it your own. He said, make it your own. He said, with every order or everything you're expected to do, you need to do it as though it's something you want to do. And you could hear me say that and you could say, well, it's Pastor Scott comparing marriage to the military. Well, I am, and it's actually appropriate to do that because the word for submit is actually a military term that refers to arranging troops. It's the Greek word arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. And so whenever you are seeing that word submit in scripture, whether referring to the marriage relationship or some other relationship, it is looking to that headship or authority that would even be, be seen in the military. So with that in mind, could you imagine if there was a soldier and he was asked to do something, he kind of rolls his eyes, you know, or, or he huffs and puffs. He's not going to last too long as a soldier, is he? Or if you, in the workplace, if an employer asked an employee to do something and the employee sat there kind of complaining or arguing, or if you're at home and you ask your children to do something and they argue with you. I think we all recognize how frustrating this is and problematic, how frowned, it, how frowned upon it is to respond that way. And we should recognize that spiritually, it should be frowned upon equally when we submit, but we do so with a bad attitude, or we do it as though it's not what we want to do. And you can understand that, whether you're a man or a woman, because there are those things where you feel convicted. You feel that God wants you to lay this down for him. He wants you to stop this or that behavior. And there's definitely ways you can do it. You can do it thankfully and say, Lord, thank you for revealing to me the sin or compromise in my life that needs to be laid down for you. Or you can do it very begrudgingly, almost angry in your prayer life. You know, Lord, I can't believe you want me to stop this, but if you want me to stop it, fine, I will, and I'll, I'll be miserable for the rest of my life. 
So in our relationships with the Lord or others, there's definitely these different ways that we can submit, and we want to strive to submit <clears throat> in a pleasing, joyful way. The next thing about submission. Submission is not part two a matter of superiority. It's not a matter of superiority. There can be a tendency to think that if wives are expected to submit to their husbands, that that means wives are inferior or that husbands are superior. And when people want to criticize submission, you'll almost always hear something like, God made men and women or husbands and wives equal, therefore wives don't need to submit to their husbands. Or because men and women are equal, then there shouldn't be any sort of headship or authority within the marriage relationship. Gloria Steinem, <clears throat> she's an American feminist. If I had to choose just one person most responsible for feminism, it would be her. And she said, a feminist is anyone who recognizes the equality and full humanity of men and women. And men and women. And what she de does with this quote or what her approach was to teach that essentially if you recognize differences, then you're calling for inequality. She, she expected that men and women had to be viewed identically, but just because there's different roles or responsibilities doesn't mean that there's a difference in value or equality. Does that make sense? And I think we recognize that in all other areas of the Christian life because when I was a school teacher and there was a principal, it didn't mean that that person was superior to me or I was inferior to him or her simply because this person had authority over me. But for some reason, this is the logic that feminists uh, or egalitarians will often apply to marriage. At best, there's a real inconsistency with this sort of thinking, and at worst, there's a real hypocrisy because they don't apply that same thinking or logic to the rest of the, to the, rest of the culture. For example, when we submit to government, when employees submit to employers, when students submit to teachers, when children submit to parents, we don't look and say that those people who are submitting are inferior to those that they're submitting to. We don't think a government is superior to its people or employers are superior to their employees. Now, if you're a Christian, there's actually an even, even bigger reason for you to recognize that submission does not mean inequality or a difference in value. Because if I said, who is the most submissive person, capital P, who has ever lived or walked the earth, who are you going to say? Jesus. Nobody has ever been more submissive than Christ. John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Listen to this verse, probably the most beautiful instance of submission that has ever taken place in history. Matthew 26, 39, Jesus went a little farther. He fell on his face and he prayed and he said, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now that is submission. That's Christ saying, not my will, but your will be done. I will make your will my own. I will take your order and do it as though it was what I want to do. And so to be consistent, if people object to wives submitting to their husband, or at least if Christians claim that a wife submitting to her husband makes that wife inferior, then what, do they, what are they also bound to claim about Christ? That he is inferior to the Father. Or in a sense, if you equate submission with inferiority, then you'd have to acknowledge that Jesus has been the most inferior person who's ever lived, because nobody has ever submitted as much as him. Every, we might we submit at times throughout our lives, but Christ submitted every single moment of his life. Every single moment was an act of submission as he sought to obey his Father and fulfill his will. And so if you think that submission makes you inferior or submission makes wives inferior, then you've got to see Jesus as the most inferior person who's ever lived. Now, the truth is <clears throat> there are few things in this life that are more Christ-like than submission. It's interesting to me that when I hear people who say they want to be like Christ and what they'll talk about is healing or performing miracles. I, I just don't hear people saying, let's be like Christ, let's be holy. Let's be like Christ, let's be submissive. Let's be like Christ, let's serve. Those are true in, in greater ways to be like Christ. A submissive heart is really to have a heart like Christ. There aren't many ways to be more like Christ than being submissive or being servants. If you want to talk about the opposite of submission, who comes to mind? Who was not comfortable with the authority that he had? Who wanted to be like God? Who didn't like the head that he had over him? The devil, Satan. I mean, as much as Jesus is the picture of submission, the devil is the picture of rebellion. He wouldn't have God uh, the Father as his head. And so I'd say it like this, 
If Jesus is that perfect picture of submission to authority, Satan is that perfect picture of rebellion. And so to submit is to be like Christ, and to rebel is to be like the devil. One of the clearest verses about submission, it's in 1 Peter 3.1. If you want to go ahead and turn there, please. 1 Peter 3.1. All right, it says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Even though 1 Peter 3, 1 says, Wives, win over their husbands without a word, I want to be clear about what this doesn't mean. We always consider con- Scripture in light of other Scripture, or another way to say it is we interpret Scripture by Scripture. When we're wondering what something means, we look at the rest of Scripture to interpret it, and this obviously doesn't mean that a wife is not going to speak or share with her husband. And this brings us to lesson three. Submission means part one, husbands still listen to their wives. Lesson three, submission means part one, husbands still listen to their wives. So Genesis 6, or Genesis 1, excuse me, but six times in that chapter, repeatedly God creates, and it was good, 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 it was good. What's the first time that God saw something that wasn't good? And remember, when's the first time he looked and said, this is not good? It was man being alone. It was man being alone. And what's interesting to consider about that is the fall had not taken place yet. We typically think that everything was good prior to sin coming into the world. We don't think that anything became not good until the curse. But you actually have God looking prior to the fall, and so it means that there, when, when God said it is not good for man to be alone, it wasn't anything Adam had done. It wasn't anything Adam had not done. He hadn't sinned. It was just him being alone. And so Genesis 2.18 I'll make him a helper comparable to him. And so, not to sound too simple, but this means that wives are going to help, my, help their husbands. Now, in my mind, there are three great resources, gentlemen, that God has given us on this side of heaven. And the, the three greatest resources, hopefully one of them is on your lap right now, your Bible. The second one, hopefully, is in you, the Holy Spirit, indwelling you. And the third one is our wives. Those are the three, three greatest resources that God has given us on this side of heaven. Now, God can use his Holy Spirit to speak to us or minister to us. He can obviously speak to us through his word. But the other great resource that I recognize I have in my life is my wife. And so, gentlemen, I would encourage you, when you want to hear from God or you want to know God's will, you want to ask your wife what she thinks. You want to have her thoughts and counsel in mind. You want to trust that God can uh, work through her to speak to you. There have been times when I thought God was revealing his will to me through Katie. He was, it could be times when he was warning me. He was correcting me. There were times that he has definitely encouraged me when I was feeling uh, particularly discouraged in life for whatever reason. And Katie delivered the, you know, the perfect words to me at that time. And I really felt like she was almost like an oracle of God that he used to, to give me the, the help that I needed. Could be times to direct me or give me counsel that was beneficial. When I went through these messages, I went through all of them with Katie and asked her what should be removed. I mean, it took, I took about a year's worth of sermons at Woodland Christian Church to take out the information to put in these five messages. And so it was very painstaking to all the parts that were removed, but Katie played a huge part in that. Every week, go over my sermon with her, my sermon for this Sunday, which will be here at Cornerstone. I went over that sermon with Katie uh, yesterday, even though it's one that I preached a few years ago. And so the main point I'm trying to make is submission definitely doesn't mean that husbands don't listen to their wives. It'd be a very, very foolish man who didn't listen to his wife. It would be the man who's rejecting, you know, one of the greatest resources that that God has given him. Let's continue discussing what submission means. Submission means part two, a wife puts her husband in a position to lead. Lesson three, submission means part two, a wife puts her husband in a position to lead. I wrestled through high school. What, what's the main enemy of wrestling? Basketball. Do you guys know that? <laughs> it is. It can, takes place at the same time. Basketball players hate wrestlers. Wrestlers think basketball players are a bunch of wimps, things like that. Um, wrestling is God's sport. I mean, God wrestled with Jacob. He wrestles with sinners' hearts. <laughs> so let's just be biblical here. 
Okay, wrestling is God's sport. <laughs> Basketball, I mean, come on, give me a break. Okay, anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, any wrestlers here by a show of hands? All right, okay, a few of you, okay. More spiritually mature people just raised their hand a second ago. Now, with that said, considering my affection for wrestling, you must know this is a great movie when I tell you it's one of my favorite movies, Hoosiers. I, don't, I mean, I didn't like basketball growing up, but I really love the, the movie Hoosiers. There's this point in it. It's a basketball movie. Um, you know, don't fault it too much for that. I wish they could have captured this in a wrestling movie. But anyway, so in, in, uh, in Hoosiers, the coach is, Gen- is Gene Hackman. And he's really disliked. He's not received well by the community. He goes in, he takes over this team. He has different, um, you know, unorthodox coaching methods. And everyone is pretty much against him. And one thing that he does to make the situation even worse is he takes the town drunk, who's played by Dennis Hopper, and he makes this gentleman his assistant coach. And so apparently Gene Hackman saw something in Dennis Hopper to make him his assistant coach. He knew that behind you know, all this man's drunkenness was a, a capable, talented coach. And so, of course, that makes everyone dislike Gene Hackman even more. And there's this interesting or really fantastic point in the movie where Gene Hackman, rec- he wants to see Dennis, Dennis Hopper lead. He wants to see him take the reins. But Gene Hackman knows that as long as he's in charge or as long as he's taking the reins, that Dennis Hopper is never going to be able to do that. And so there's this moment in the movie where Gene Hackman starts throwing this fit in the middle of this crucial basketball game. And the referee looks at Gene Hackman and he says, hey, if you don't calm down, I'm going to kick you out of here. And Gene Hackman leans into the ref and he says, kick me out. And the ref says, what? He says, kick me out. If you don't kick me out of here right now, I'm going to throw an even worse fit. And so the ref says, okay, you're out of here. And he throws Gene Hackman out of the gymnasium. You know, half the people cheer because they hate Gene Hackman. And then the other half of the people, um, you know, are kind of like booing and so forth. So what Gene Hackman does before he leaves is he walks over to his assistant coach, Dennis Hopper, and he hands him the playbook. And what does he say to him? He says, you're in charge. You're in charge. Can you see why I'm telling you that, ladies? Do you see why that's a fitting story? That's what you need to do. You need to put your husband in a position to lead. As long as you're in charge or trying to take charge, you're making it very difficult for him. Because I want to be honest with some of you ladies, your husband doesn't lead because you don't let him. Or you want him to lead, but you want to kind of keep your hands on the steering wheel. Or you say you want him in the front of the saddle, but you want to reach around and still kind of hold on to the reins. And so if you really want your husband to lead, you need to strive to have him in that position. And sometimes when a woman will tell me that she wants her husband to lead, what she really means is she wants her husband to do what she wants him to do. That's not leadership. If you want your husband to lead, but you just want him to make the decisions that you think are best, or you're going to try to control him, that's not real leadership. Sometimes you'll even have wives who are trying to control their husbands while they're complaining that their husbands don't do anything. I'll hear wives and they'll complain about their husbands not leading, and they'll complain <clears throat> by, and then they'll be making all the decisions. They'll be controlling all the situations. They'll be dominating their husbands, and then they turn around and they say, I have to do everything. I can't count on my husband. I'm so tired of not being able to be able to trust him to handle anything. And so when your husband starts to lead, let me be clear with you ladies about what not to do. Don't complain about the decisions he makes. Don't get upset when he doesn't do things the way that you would do them. And most importantly, resist that temptation to take over. There are some husbands, and they simply do not feel the weight of leadership or responsibility on their shoulders because their wives don't let that weight rest on their husband's shoulders. Some wives are too busy trying to lift that mantle and put it on their own shoulders, take on that burden of responsibility themselves. So ladies, if you want your husband to lead, put that responsibility on his shoulders. Put yourself behind him. Make him feel like he has to lead because you won't. Let him know that there's no way you're going to take over. Now, if you do this, you're going to increase the likelihood that your husband's going to what? Take his position seriously, that he's going to lead. You're going to increase the chances that he'll be a man of prayer because he'll feel the greater responsibility or or accountability. You'll increase the likelihood that your husband will be in the word more. You'll increase the likelihood that he'll seek God, that he'll take his relationship with the Lord more seriously. But if he thinks that it doesn't really matter what he does anyway, because first, you're not going to support him, or second, you're going to try to take charge anyway, then don't be surprised when your husband doesn't take his role seriously. Don't be surprised when you don't see him leading in the home. 
One reason some husbands don't lead is they simply don't want to try to compete with their wives. It's not worth the conflict for them. It's not worth all of the energy that it would cost. There are some men who don't even think of leading because they know that it's going to be the battle. Um, They know the battle that they're going to face with their wives if they try. I've heard women say, I have to do it because if I don't do it, it won't get done. I think that's a very reasonable response. I'm not faulting any women who might even have that thought in the back of their minds while I'm discussing this. It'd be very reasonable if some of you ladies were saying, well, I have to do it because my husband won't do it. I'll have a few responses to that. First, how do you know it won't get done? You don't know for sure. Because at this point, your husband isn't feeling responsible to do it because he can suspect that you're going to end up doing it yourself. So maybe your husband is so used to you taking matters into your own hands that he doesn't even bother. Maybe if he realized that you weren't going to do it, then he would step up. At some point, your husband's going to figure out, you know, she's really not going to take over. I need to be a man. I need to lead. She's expecting me to lead. I better get my act together. That's what will start to be communicated to him. Now, second, here's the honest truth. Maybe some things won't get done. Maybe there are some number of things that are going to end up falling through the cracks when you start putting your husband in a position to lead. I'm definitely not going to lie to you and tell you that if you do what I'm recommending here, that everything's going to be smooth sailing after that and go perfectly. The truth is it's probably going to be messy. There are probably going to be some number of things that don't get done. But regardless of of how your husband does, and regardless of whether he does it to to your standards, or regardless of whether he does things, you know, as perfectly as you think God expects, it's important to understand that it's still his job to do it. It's still his God-given role. That responsibility still rests on his shoulders. You can't find a verse in Scripture that commands wives to lead if their husbands don't lead. There's nothing that supports that. So even if your husband isn't leading or is failing in this way, it's still your responsibility to be behind him and support him and encourage him and see him grow grow in that role. Helen Andelin said, let your husband have full reign. Do not stand back with anxiety wondering if things will turn out all right. If he makes mistakes, if he gets into difficulty, let him suffer the consequences. It is the only way he will learn to lead. Because I think we recognize that in any area of life, if people are given real leadership or responsibility or authority, there has to be the potential for them to what? Fail. There has to be the potential for them to fail. If, if there's someone who's always swooping in and preventing, them, preventing that from happening, they're never going to learn. So here's my encouragement, ladies. Put your husband in the driver's seat and make him lead. You know, maybe he's going to be all over the road at first. And, and if that's the case, just keep reminding yourself, the driver's seat does not belong to me. This is my husband's. I will let him drive. Now, I want you to picture a situation. Let's say there's a woman who's listening to this, kind of let's continue with this driving analogy, and she becomes convicted to make sure that her husband leads, and she's going to give him the driver's seat. You know, maybe this is the first time she ever has, and so she hands him the key. She tells him he's going to drive. She races over to the, to the passenger seat so that he can't sit in it. And they take off and they start driving, <clears throat> but then picture this. She starts saying what? Turn here. Aren't you going to get over? Aren't you going too fast? Aren't you going too slow? Why do you always choose this lane? Are you going to stop? Haven't you been stopped long enough? The classic one, isn't it about time for us to pull over and get gas? Now, if she keeps giving him orders like that, this is going to feel a lot more like a driver's ed class, Right? There's no way that a husband is going to learn if his wife is acting like that. Now, after listening to something like this, here's one of the main arguments I've heard from women uh, about submission. I wouldn't grab the wheel if my husband knew where he was going. Or I wouldn't tell my husband what to do if I could trust his decisions. I wouldn't try to take over if I agreed with him. These, are, these words basically communicate, I would submit to my husband or I would expect him to lead if I agreed with him. Now, just follow that logic for a moment. I would submit to my husband if I agreed with him. And this brings us to the next part of lesson three. Submission means part three, a wife supports her husband even though she disagrees with him. Submission means a wife supports her husband even though she disagrees with him. When a wife says, I would submit to my husband if I agreed with him, what she's really saying is, I would submit to my husband if it didn't involve any submission. Does that make sense? 
Let me say that one more time. When a wife says, which I've heard this, I would submit to my husband if I agreed with him. What she's saying is I would submit to my husband if it didn't involve any submission. Consider submission is entirely in place for when you don't agree with your husband. You wouldn't need to submit if you always agreed. God has put submission in place entirely for those moments when a wife disagrees with her husband. So just let's picture this scenario. I hope I've communicated somewhat last night, and especially in this uh, message up to this point, that husbands should listen to their wives. They should hear their wives' counsel. They should receive their wives' advice, even correction you know, and criticism at times. But let's say that a husband's facing a decision. He has heard everything that his wife has to say, and, but he does not agree with her. And so she obviously doesn't agree with him. How does the relationship go forward at that point? You know, is it paper, rock, scissors? Do you flip a coin? In some marriages, perhaps that's the uh, approach they take. But God has said at those moments when a standstill is reached like that, after a husband has heard his wife's counsel and he still feels that this is the best course of action, then for the relationship to go forward, the husband will be the decision maker. At that moment, when you've reached an impasse, for, the, for a decision to be made, then it rests on the husband's shoulders. Now, at this point, the wife needs to keep something in mind, and this is really important. Ladies, when your husband makes a decision and you're forced to submit, you clearly don't agree with him, you think he's making the wrong decision, you need to be encouraged that you are only going to be held responsible with supporting your husband. Your responsibility ends at supporting your husband. Your responsibility definitely doesn't end at making sure the right decision is made. Because if your responsibility was to make sure that the right decision was made, then you would never submit, right? You would argue, or if I can say it, nag your husband until he finally gives in and just makes a decision that you think is best. And so be encouraged, ladies, that your, hus- your responsibility ends not at making sure the right decision is made because obviously you think the wrong decision is being made or you wouldn't be forced to submit at this moment. Your responsibility is supporting your husband. So a good way for wives to think about submission is you're not supporting the idea. You're not supporting the decision. You think it's a bad idea or you think it's the wrong decision. But guess what you're supporting, ladies? You're supporting the man behind the idea. You're supporting your husband. That's what you're supporting, not the idea itself. Submission is saying, I love my husband. I respect him. I want to support him. So even though I disagree, I'm going to go along with this decision the best that I can. I'm going to make this order my own. I I have said my piece. I've shared my thoughts and counsel. I'm going to do my best at this point to be a help and an encouragement to my husband. And there's one reason that wives submit to their husbands and it actually has nothing to do with the wife's relationship with her husband. Let me say that one more time. In fact, I'll go so far as to say, ladies, you don't submit to your husband because of your relationship with him. You, support, you submit to your husband because of your relationship with someone else. And this brings us to the next part of lesson three. Submission means part four, a wife trusts God. Lesson three, submission means part four, a wife trusts God. I've heard women say, and the truth is I completely understand them feeling this way, I have trouble submitting to my husband because I don't trust him. Or it would be easier for me to submit to my husband if I could trust him more. Or I've heard women say, I do trust God, I just don't trust my husband. But according to God's word, your submission to your husband, ladies, is not about your relationship with your husband. And it is not about your trust in him. Your submission to your husband is about your trust in the Lord himself. If you're still in 1 Peter 3, look at verse 5, so you don't think this is my opinion. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. So these godly women of the Old Testament... Why did they submit to their husbands? Because their husbands were perfect or exemplary or always made the right decisions or because they trusted their husbands so much? No. They submitted to their husbands because they trusted God. A wife's submission does not have so much to do with whether she trusts her husband. It basically has everything to do with how much she trusts God. A wife's submission is a reflection of her trust in God. It's a woman's trust in God or her faith in God or her confidence in God that combats that terror 
And that's not an understatement to use, or that's not an overstatement to use that word terror. That's that faith or confidence or trust in God is what combats that fear or terror that that woman has associated with submitting to her husband. And here's the question. Why is it then when wives are supposed to submit to her husbands, their husbands that they're trusting God? Why is it an issue of trust with God first? Because God is sovereign. He's in control. And that's what you need to remember. Even though you're turning the reins over to your husband in, regarding his leadership and decision-making, and your husband might look like he's the one who's sovereign or in control, God is still the one who's sovereign and in, in control. But the main reason that your, your submission to your husband is in the issue of trusting, your, trusting God is God is the one who's commanded it. It's obedient to God. This is what God expects. This is the primary command that he's given to wives. Briefly look at 1 Peter 3, 6. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good, and are not afraid with any terror. Now, Sarah is brought forth from the Old Testament as the example for women in the New Testament. And I know what some of you ladies are saying. You're saying, oh, you know what? I would have no problem submitting to my husband if my husband was Abraham. I would have, <laughs> this whole submission thing would be so much easier if my husband was the father of faith. Let me ask you something, ladies. Do you think that it was easy for Sarah to submit to Abraham? I think one of the main reasons that Sarah is brought forth is because of the difficulty associated with being married to Abraham. The diff, for two reasons. One, the difficult calling on his life. How many times did they move? How many times do you think Sarah was just getting comfortable, but then because of that nomadic lifestyle, Abraham said, well, it's time to go again, and she had to pick up her stuff and go, not dig in her heels and complain and argue about that. So I'm sure that that made it very difficult. But aside from the nomadic lifestyle, the other thing that made it difficult being married to Abraham was he made terribly foolish decisions at times. What, would that, what do you think that was like for her when Abraham says, I'm afraid for my life, why don't you lie and say that you're my sister? I mean, how cowardly did he look at that moment? And to make it even worse, how many times did he do that? He didn't do it once, he did it twice. It went badly the first time and then it went badly the second time. And what's interesting is, it's a, t it's a very difficult situation for me to discuss because I can't say that a wife should submit to sin. I can't say that. And since Abraham was asking Sarah to be deceitful, this is why it's so difficult to discuss, but I will say this to you. Sarah submitted to Abraham, and what did God do? He protected her. He protected her in her submission. Even though her husband was making terribly foolish decisions, you still see the way that God was sovereign and he protected her despite the, the bad decisions that he was making. Notice the words afraid with any terror at the end of verse 6. I just want you to see the Since submission involves overcoming fear, or I suppose, I mean, and you just think of what some of the fear is. Uh, if, if it's a major decision, a woman could say, what happens if my husband makes this decision and it ruins our family? What if we're not supposed to go to this church? What if, we're, what if he's not supposed to take this job? What if we're not supposed to let our children do this? What if we're supposed to make our children do this instead? I mean, these are the sorts of decisions that really can be characterized by terror. And God wants to let you know that he recognizes that, but he still expects you to submit. Now, because submission involves overcoming terror, because submission takes so much strength on a wife's part, this teaches us something about submission that I think is very, very important to understand or keep in mind. This brings us to the next part of lesson three. Submission means part five, a wife keeps her strength under control. Submission means part five, a wife keeps her strength under control. Now, since submission <clears throat> is such a terrifying thing for wives, what does this tell us about women who submit? That they're what? Brave, that they're strong, that they're courageous. I'll be honest with you. There are plenty of women, and they are not strong enough to submit. There are plenty of women, they do not have the faith in God to submit. Their relationships, their trust in the Lord is not strong enough for them to submit, there are plenty of women who simply don't have the, the, um, the faith, the strength, the courage, the bravery that's required to overcome that fear. So please understand this, ladies. 
When you submit to your husband, it is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. When you submit to your husband, it is not a sign of being faithless. It is a sign of being faithful because of the tremendous faith in the Lord it requires to submit. Submission is not for weak, wimpy doormats. There are people who think that, that, oh, this wife submits to her husband because she's so weak and wimpy. No, submission is for strong, godly, faith-filled women because those, those are the only women who can submit. I want to briefly share a personal story with you that I hope helps illustrate what we've been discussing. The summer after my eighth grade year, I flew up to uh, upstate New York to work on this dairy farm that my dad had worked on. So it's kind of like this nostalgic, nostalgic thing. I grew up hearing about my dad working on his uncle's dairy farm, and then after eighth grade, I flew to that same dairy farm from California to work on it. And uh, that's when I realized I never wanted to work on a dairy farm when I got older. And so I went there. I had never met any of these people before. I didn't know anyone. I had never been to this area. And so nobody else there was my age. All of my, whether they were like second cousins or whatever relationship, they're all older. They had kids that were like younger than me. So I, I had to find things to do to entertain myself. It was, it was unbelievably boring. And so just like any uh, good 13-year-old, um, some of the things I found to do were not the wisest. And so there was this bull that stood <laughs> at the end of this barn. And I'd go in and help them with all the different chores and so forth in the barn. And every time that I went into the barn, I saw this bull just standing there. He looked like a statue, you know, just, just staring straight ahead. And so there was one day, I suppose, when I was particularly bored, that I thought it would be fun to go down there and try to get the bull to move, okay? And so I'm down there, and apparently when this bull was not enjoying me messing with him, or trying to get him to move as much as I was enjoying it. You know, I thought it was pre pretty entertaining, and as he's not moving any muscles, you know, I decided I'm going to become even more aggressive with him. And so at some point, when he was particularly agitated, I suppose, he lifted up his head underneath me, and he just launched me into the air. And so kind of think of like rodeos, you know, where a cowboy gets thrown off the bull, and their arms and legs are, you know, flailing through the air, and then they come crashing back down to earth. Well, fortunately, the, the barn roof was high enough that I didn't slam into the ceiling, but I did come crashing back down and land on the cement. And so I guess it would have, been, would have been a cousin, but he was more like an uncle to me who was down at the other end of the barn. He saw this happen, and he probably would have clearly stopped me earlier if he would have known what I was doing. And so he runs down, and he was, I just remember he was screaming at me. And he was so upset because he was telling me that I could have killed myself. And he said, you know, you're this, I mean, you're so fortunate. You have no idea that the worst thing that happened is you got thrown in the air and came crashing down because this bull, he could have trampled you, you know, or he could have gored you or something like that. And the reason I'm telling you this is when he was talking to me, he said, do you see that little chain that's around that bull's neck? And I hadn't really noticed it before, but yeah, it looked particularly small, especially compared to the size and, and strength of this bull. And he says, that is the only thing that's holding him there. He could break that chain at any moment. At any second, he could break that. And so basically, my cousin told me that that bull wasn't held there for any reason other than it allowed itself to be held by that chain. And I mean, the tremendous amount of strength that was under control there at that moment. And I thought two things. First, I thought, why don't they put a bigger chain around his neck? <laughs> And the second thing I thought was, wow, that bull has a tremendous amount of strength, and it's allowing all of that strength to be subdued by that little chain. Can you see why I'm telling you this? I would like to encourage you to think of submission that way. Submission is strength, or it's power that is restrained, or it is under control. Submission is a choice. It, it is deliberate. It's willful. It, forced submission is not submission. And so, ladies, I guess another way I could say it is, on behalf of the men, I share with you, we know you could launch us into the air. <laughs> we know that you could throw off our headship or authority. We know that you don't have to submit to us. We know that when you do, you are subduing your strength. You're putting a lot of strength under control at those moments. We, we know that this is not something you have to do. That you're, We recognize that you're doing this because of your relationships with Christ. We recognize that this is terrifying for you, we, that it's difficult, but it's something that you're going to do because you love the Lord and because you respect us as your husbands. 
Now, understandably, there's one question I hear often from women when it comes to submission, and they say, what happens if my husband makes the wrong decision? What happens if my husband makes the wrong decision? Which isn't really the best way to word that question. Women should probably say, what happens? Um, did I say, what happens? Sometimes a woman will say, what happens if my husband makes the wrong decision? A better question would be, what happens when my husband makes the wrong decision? Because the truth is, we're going to, to make wrong decisions. So let's talk about that inevitable reality. Lesson four, part one, husbands should admit when they're wrong. Husbands should admit when they're wrong. Let's just go back to that driving analogy. And so yeah, the husband and wife are heading down the road, and the wife wants to be that good helper. I'm serious. And so she says, I think you're supposed to turn here. Fine for a wife to say that. Now, if she doesn't want to nag, she's going to say it once, maybe twice, but she's not going to say it 10 or 20 times, right? If she's going to be a good helper, she's going to share that with her husband, and she's going to say, I think this is the place we're supposed to turn. But let's just say that this husband says, no, don't turn there, or we're not going to turn there. It's, it's the next turn. And so the wife doesn't keep arguing with him, but then let's say it turns out that she was right and he was wrong. Okay, now at this moment, I want to tell the husbands what they should do and what they shouldn't do. The first thing they shouldn't do is they shouldn't start making a whole bunch of excuses. They shouldn't start saying things like, well, the last time that I drove here, you know, that's not where we turned, and we turned at the next place, and so that's why I was thinking that, the, that we weren't supposed to turn there this time. Or a husband shouldn't say, well, you know, I would have known to turn there if, it, if, if the kids in the back had been a little quieter, but they were so noisy, it made it so hard for me to concentrate. Or I would have known to, tur to turn there if the radio wasn't so loud. Or maybe if you were helping those kids not be fighting back there. And so when a husband does things like that, it makes him look small. It makes him look bad when he starts justifying and making all of those excuses. What a godly man will do is he should admit that he made the wrong decision. He shouldn't justify, he shouldn't excuse. If he wants to be his wife's hero, then he could also say, you were right and I was wrong. It takes a lot of humility to do that, but it's something that would, would very, be very endearing or uh, make a wife very appreciative. Now, if a husband wasn't listening to his wife, now let's, uh, let's understand there's two ways that a husband could miss that turn. He could miss that turn ignorantly, and I mean that in the nicest way, like he just didn't think that that was the place to turn. But he could also miss that turn sinfully because he's being stubborn, something we struggle with like we talked about last night, or he's being prideful. Now, if he missed the turn ignorantly, I don't think that the husband needs to apologize and ask for forgiveness. He should admit that he was wrong. He should admit that his wife was right. But if a husband was being prideful or stubborn, those are sins and he needs to confess them. So if the husband was being stubborn or prideful, he needs to confess that and then he needs to ask his wife for forgiveness. He needs to say, I'm sorry, I was being stubborn. I was just choosing not to listen to you because I was being prideful or because I was upset. Will you please forgive me? Now, when a husband admits he made a mistake, it does a few things. First, it blesses his wife. I mean, I should get a few amens from that, right, ladies? It blesses his wife. Second, it encourages his wife. It, it makes his wife's submission easier in the future. A wife will have a much easier time submitting to a husband when she knows that that husband is willing to admit when he's wrong. And so, yes, um, gentlemen, your wife is commanded to submit to you. There's no if in that verse, just like there's no if in Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives. It doesn't say if, and it doesn't say wives submit to your husbands if. So we recognize our wives are commanded to submit to us, but we can make that easier for them and one of the ways that we can make it easier is by, by being humble men who admit when we're wrong and ask for forgiveness when we're being prideful or stubborn. And the third thing it does is it sets a good example. Because, gentlemen, I want to share something important with you, and I want to say this clearly. Making decisions is a very small part of being a leader in the home. Making decisions is a very small part of being a leader or godly husband in the home. The example we set is way more significant way more significant. We lead by the example we set. We lead by being humble because that's how we can be like Christ. If we're to be to our wives what Christ is to the church, then we need to be to our wives what Christ is to the church, which is humble, his meekness. So to think, if you think, well, I'm going to be a strong leader in my home, I'm going to go home and make all these decisions, eh, a very small part if you think, I want to go home and I want to be a godly leader in my home, I'm going to be humble. I'm going to set a good example for my, for my wife and my family. 
that would be the right approach. Last message, we talked about husbands getting the wives that they prepare for themselves. And if husbands are going to make excuses, if they're going to justify themselves, if they're going to shift blame, blame their wives or blame their children, then what are we going to have as husbands? We're going to have wives and children who do that. We're going to have wives and children who learn from our example, justify themselves, make excuses, blame others. But if husbands will be humble, if we will accept responsibility for our decisions, if we'll admit when we're wrong, maybe most importantly, if we'll ask for forgiveness when we should, then we're probably going to have wives and children who will do the same and learn that from us, who will be humble, who will accept responsibility, who will admit when they're wrong, who will ask for forgiveness too. Now, I want to provide a little balance to this. If a husband definitely doesn't listen to his wife because he's being stubborn and prideful, then yes, he needs to confess that and he needs to ask for forgiveness. But consider the other side of this. A husband has listened to his wife. He has heard her thoughts and counsel. He has been prayerful. Perhaps he's talked to uh, elders in the church or other godly men. There's wisdom found in many counselors. He has taken all of the steps that he can reasonably to make the right decision. He makes the decision that he thinks is best, and it still ends up being the wrong decision. Does he really need to be made to feel like he did something wrong, ladies? No, he doesn't. It wasn't done deliberately or sinfully or selfishly. He doesn't need to be kicked when he's down or made to feel really terrible about a decision he made that was a decision he thought was going to be best for his family. It might not have been the same decision you would have made, but to your husband, it's the decision that he thought was best. He shouldn't be made to feel like he sinned. Now, let me address the wives. Something that makes this whole situation more interesting or makes it more difficult, depending how you look at it, is if a wife submits to her husband, she has to submit because she doesn't agree with him. And so what that means is if a husband makes a decision and he's wrong and his wife submitted to her, then that decision was made going into it with the wife, with both parties, recognizing that the husband's making a decision that the wife thinks is wrong and that the wife wanted to make another decision instead. And so this is going to bring up some obvious tension when the husband ends up being wrong. There's going to be a real potential for you ladies at that moment when your husband is wrong to do some things that would be sinful that I want to discourage you from doing. And this brings us to the next part of lesson four. Part one, husbands should admit when they're wrong. Part two, and wives shouldn't say, any guesses? (laughs) Yes, I told you so. Very good. Very good. I'll just say whether you're a husband, whether you're a wife, whether you're a child, whether you're a parent, whether you're an employee, employer, student, neighbor, whatever, there is no position in life where it is ever appropriate to say, I told you so. There are no circumstances you can ever create where it is ever appropriate to say, I told you so. Those words, I told you so, they're always prideful, they're always obnoxious, they're always ugly, they're always fleshly. So whenever you're thinking of saying, I told you so, you need to remind yourself, I am about to do something that's obnoxious, prideful, fleshly, ugly. So there's no, there's no arena or of, in, in life, there's no sphere of ministry in which it's ever appropriate to say, I told you so. When a husband has the humility to say, I made the wrong decision, a godly wife, well, let's deal with an ungodly wife first. When a husband has the humility to say, I made the wrong decision, an ungodly wife is going to say, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. I told you not to do that, and you did it anyway. You should have listened to me. That was pathetic, or that was terrible. That's how an ungodly wife responds. A godly wife says, that was very humble of you. Thank you for saying that. I know that wasn't an easy thing to say. A godly wife says, you made the decision you thought was best for our family. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for having the humility to come and and say that to me. It makes it so much easier to trust you and and submit to you in the future. I know that you were simply making the decision that you thought was best for our family and nobody's right or nobody's perfect all the time. The truth is, if you want to be a godly wife, when your husband makes the wrong decision, he's already going to be feeling bad enough. And he's going to be looking for the most important person in his life to be a support and encouragement to him in that moment, not beat him up about it. Now, I know what some of you ladies are saying at this point, and this is very reasonable. You're saying, well, what if my husband doesn't have the humility to come and say that he was wrong? What if my husband doesn't have the humility to come to me and say that you were right? What if he's going to be prideful and stubborn? Then guess what, ladies? What do you still not say? You still don't say, I told you so. 
you still don't say I was right. You still don't say you should have listened to me. You still don't say you were wrong. Now, I'm sorry, ladies, if you were married to a man, and I mean this sincerely, I don't want to sound insensitive to you. I am sorry if you're married to a man and he doesn't have the humility to do this. And your husband goes home and he makes the wrong decision and you're waiting, based on what I've said here, for him to come to you and apologize and say that he was wrong and he just doesn't do it. I really am sorry if you're married to a man like that. And I guess I would just say briefly to the gentleman, don't be like that. Don't be that man. But if that's the case, ladies, you don't say I told you so and you don't go and argue with your husband, you pray. You pray that God gives him the humility that he needs. You pray that God helps him to be a different man. You pray that God will change his heart so he can be a man that comes to you and acknowledges fault and accepts responsibility for his actions. And I'll, I'll be clear, ladies, I don't want to deceive you. If you're married to a prideful or stubborn man, maybe it'll be some number of years, maybe it'll be some number of decades before you see the sort of humility in your husband that you want to see. Maybe you, you'll never see it even but it's still never right to say, I told you so, or to try to beat him up about that. Instead, just allow your humility. If you respond that way, I mean, thinking of the language of 1 Peter 3, 1, it's going to be your chaste or godly conduct that's going to win over your husband. When your husband knows he's wrong and you didn't come to him and say, I told you so, or you were wrong and I was right, and your husband sees you responding in such a godly manner, rare is the man who won't be convicted by that example. Ladies, let your example, let your submission, your Christ-like conduct win over your husband, not your words, not, not nagging him. Let your husband see the gospel at work through you. Let your husband see your gentleness toward him because he knows he's wrong. He knows you could come and beat him up about that. And when he sees you responding to him respectfully, lovingly, submissively, I mean, rare is the man who's not going to be terribly convicted by that and just let the Holy Spirit beat his heart up. Let the Holy Spirit just go in there and pound on him and pound on him and pound on him until he's so convicted that he breaks and finally comes and confesses his sin. But don't be the one to try to be the Holy Spirit in, in your husband's life. I want to share a situation with you from our marriage that I'll never forget that uh, I hope illustrates this lesson. Back in 2005, I was an elementary school teacher and I wanted to take better care of my family financially. I knew we were going to homeschool, thought we might have some, you know, who knows how many children. And so I thought of becoming a principal, but then I learned that there was a, school, a teaching position available in, an, in another district locally on a naval base. And because I had been in the military, this base received federal funding, so they paid teachers more money. I would have received some, some extra money from my time in the military. So it was about a twenty dollars or $25,000 raise to, to switch from this school district to work on the base. And so I thought, oh, wow, well, this is great. I don't have to become a principal and go through all of the, the credentialing for that. I can, I can stay in the classroom with kids and teach, which is what I wanted to do, and I'll make uh, more money to take care of my family. So I'm driving to this interview, and I still remember this pretty clearly, going down the road, and I'm trying to hold this loosely before the Lord, and I say, Lord, you know what's best for my family. I trust you. If you want me to stay in this position, at, at the, my current position, then I believe that you'll take care of me and my family. But if this is the job you have for me and you want me to make this fairly dramatic change in my life, then um, please make that clear to me. Open the door and, and let me know, you know that, I should, that I should walk through it. So I go to this interview. I felt like it went really well. They sent me out to the office and then something which I thought might have been characteristic. About 10 minutes later, they brought me back into the office, superintendent, assistant superintendent, these other people are in there. And the superintendent slides this paper across the desk and he says, here's what we'd like to offer you. And it was more than I, more than I imagined, a lot more than I was currently making. And he said, we'd love for you to come and work at our school district with us. And so I just thought, you know, this is it. This is what God had for me. I'm driving back from that interview and I call Katie. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. They offered me the position uh, at the interview, basically. And so, yeah, come, you know, 2000, whatever the next school year was, 2006, I'm going to be a jet because that was the, the uh, mascot for the school. Well, something interesting happened. It, I don't know that it's the same in Washington, but in California, when you leave one district, you, leave your te you lose your tenure. You no longer have a safe, secure position. If the district wants to release you, all they need to do is just walk into your classroom literally and say, you don't have to come back the next day. Now, they never do that. They let you finish out the school year, but they do come and tell you, we don't need you back the next year. And I know that because that's what happened to me. Because that was 2005, and then anyone remember what happened in 2007? The great recession. 
And so all of these districts were cutting teachers. And so even though I had been teaching eight years at this point and had been secure and tenured in my other district, I was a brand new teacher at this district. And so when they cut teachers and they looked at seniority and I was, you know, had less seniority than anyone else, I was one of the teachers to be cut. Katie was pregnant at that time. I had lost my job. I'd lost all of our wonderful medical insurance. And I also knew that I wasn't going to be getting another teaching job because nobody else was hiring. And so it was just seemed like a very dismal and, and dark, um, desperate moment in my life. I remember feeling very much like a failure, like I let my family down. I felt like, what, how, what kind of spiritual leader am I that here I prayed for God's will and I think I heard from God, and then I, I end up unemployed. You know, I, I was very vulnerable for me as a husband, as a man at that time. I remember just feeling like um, not wanting to go home and see my pregnant wife. And so I went home, and I was talking to Katie, and here's what she could have said to me. She could have said, you know, I, I do still love you, and I'm going to stay married to you, but man, that was a terrible decision. What were you thinking? You know, you're supposed to be the, the spiritual leader of our family, and you pray about a job and take it, and your prayer life gets you fired. You know, your prayer life ends up with you unemployed and without, and without us having any insurance. You know, next time you better pray a little harder. Next time your prayer better involve some fasting, too, before you make another decision like this, because it doesn't affect just you, it affects me, and I'm pregnant. I mean, just imagine all the ugly, terrible things that, that Katie could have said. I will never forget what she did say. She said, I'm so excited to see what God's going to do. She said, I'm so excited to see what God's going to do. I know that he's going to provide for us. I remember her saying that to me when we were laying in bed and she had her head on my chest and she was just such a constant encouragement to me during one of the lowest points in my life when I felt like such a huge failure. And ladies, there's not that many opportunities in your life where your husband is going to feel as low as I did at that moment. And you don't want to waste those moments. You want to be that helper for him. You want to be that encouragement and that support to him that he needs because I've never forgot that, and as long as God lets me teach on marriage, I will always share that story, and it will always be meaningful and emotional to me, thinking of how Katie was such a tremendous wife for me. I know she must have been stressed. I know there must have been so much anxiety that she could have been feeling at that moment, but if she did, she didn't show any of it. She, I had a terrible burden on my shoulders, and all she did was lighten it. All she did was, was alleviate that stress that I was under. To make a long story short, that's actually when a church that I was working for part-time hired me full-time. So they did something that, I, that surprised me. They stepped out in faith. They did not have the budget for it. But I told my senior pastor at the time, Pastor Joe, I said, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to stay around here. You know, I, I need to let you know I'm probably going to be leaving because I, I know nobody's hiring here. And the, the church stretched themselves financially, and a lot of people must have given more. It was a church of only like maybe 150, 160, maybe 180, and they brought me on full-time, and God did provide. Um, but I didn't see all that, you know, and I went home at that dark moment to face my wife. And so there's a couple things I really appreciate about that season, and it was just um, primarily, you know, that the church came alongside me, but even more importantly, the way my wife came alongside me and, di and didn't make me feel worse. Strive to be that for your husband's ladies. There's a huge weight that's on your husband's shoulders that he carries every day trying to provide for his family and take care of, take care of his home. Do what you can to make that lighter. Don't make it heavier for him. So let me conclude with this. Gentlemen, when we're wrong, not if we're wrong, but when we're wrong, let's be humble about it. Let's admit it. Let's confess it to our wives. Wives, when your husbands make a mistake, don't say, I told you so. Be an encouragement. Be a help to them. Don't make them feel worse. Try to be that helper that God wants you to be for them. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for marriage. Thank you for submission that in your wisdom you have recognized what husbands and wives should do. I don't know how familiar this teaching was to uh, the women here, perhaps very familiar, but if I pray especially for those that it might be unfamiliar to, that it's something that they can embrace, not because it's my opinion or thoughts about marriage, but because you're wise and this is what you've said and, and this is what you know is best for marriages. And so we thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that you give us in our world or that you give us in marriage we know that it runs countercultural. We know that it runs against the counsel and instruction that we get from the world. Uh, a wife submitting to her husband is the last thing that the world would say. It's the last thing that the world currently says. The world preaching that feminist um, uh, agenda and that the world just pushing the egalitarian 
uh, agenda, even in churches, Lord. I pray we can hold strong against it, that we will cling to your word and what it teaches us. So if for no other reason that we can have marriages that reflect Christ and his relationship to the church, we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen, amen.